Good evening. I hereby call this meeting of the Public Safety Committee to order. As always, we'd like to thank uh, all of our citizens for the work that they do in our community. Uh, and those citizens work very closely with city staff. We'd like to honor our public safety staff who are here with us today. I see the brave men and women of the Winston-Salem Police Department here today. Thank you, led by uh, Chief Thompson. Uh, the brave men and women of the fire department, led by Chief Mayo. And um, the brave men and women of the emergency management department. Uh, Mr. August Vernon is not here today. I understand he's out and handling some important business regarding the closing of Business 40, so we wish him well and thank him for his hard work. I would like to recognize the city manager, Mr. Lee Garrity. Uh, thank you to the assistant city managers, our city attorney, Attorney Carmen, our public safety attorney, Attorney Sykes, and I think that pretty much sews it up, so thank you all for what you do uh, for our city. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Burke has indicated that Mr. Al Andrews and the city attorney's office is here as well. I didn't see you. Mr. Andrews, thank you for being here with us today. Uh, we have four items on the consent agenda. Those items deal with uh, speed limit reductions. There is an item approving public safety committee a summary of minutes. Items on the consent agenda are unanimously approved unless a member of this committee or the council wishes it to be pulled for consideration. There are two items on the general agenda. We'll be discussing an item regarding urban hunting opportunities and an item regarding, regarding the dockless bicycle and scooter share programs. So, members of the committee, are there any items on consent agenda that should be for, for consideration? If none, I would entertain a motion. Second. It's been motion properly seconded. All in favor of approving the consent agenda, please vote yes. Opposes, likewise. All right, so we have a little technical difficulty. It, it appears that uh, the motion passes four to zero, so the consent agenda is approved. We will then move to item G1, please. Madam Secretary. Presentation on urban hunting opportunities. We have with us today Ms. Carolyn Fay, who's gonna give us a presentation. Before she comes to speak, I wanna turn it over to Mr. Damon DeCane, who will cue this item up for consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Taylor, Mayor Pro Tem Burke, members of the committee. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Ms. Carolyn Fay, who's a city resident. She'll be presenting information on urban hunting and uh, as it relates to North Carolina hunters for the hunt. Uh, so without further ado, okay. Ms. Fay, thank you for uh, being here and for bringing this item up for our consideration. We just appreciate your time. You have the floor. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Um, as he said, I'm a resident of Winston-Salem. I live at um, 26 Pacine. 2916 Bradenton Drive, which is out off of Burke Mill after it passes Bolton. And um, I live in a cluster home community. It's uh, 106 homes, um, home, you know, regular size lots. I, I have one of the biggest, I have the biggest lot in the community. And I back onto um, Burke Mill Creek, which gets all the runoff from Hospice and Haynes Mall. Uh, uh, shopping center and it overflows and there are woods there going down into those lakes that are below where the veterans hospital is, veterans place is. Okay, so that gives you a little feeling for where I live. So even though not, I'm a member of the city, um, I have a, a big plot of land. I love the outdoors. I love animals. I am a vegetable gardener um, and other things. So what got me going on this was that for several years, and I do mean several, I have been uh, fighting the, the overpopulation problem of the deer. The deer have been in my yard eating everything they can find, um, including the things in my vegetable garden. <coughs> and so I've tried everything from um, noxious smelling uh, deer and rabbit repellent called liquid fence. Then the next thing I did was put up a uh, 30 pound monofilament fence, which had been recommended to me by some people you know, connected to the city council actually, because they'd found out, I Googled it and went online and found out about a lot of farmers that are using this 30, 30 pound monofilament around their gardens, strung every six inches, so that when the deer hit it, they back off because they feel it. But actually, in between there, I had three uh, Amazon deer sentinels, ultrasonic deer sentinels, focused on the approaches from the creek and also on the vegetable garden. 
And so when, and when they would see it, it would light up and emit an ultrasonic noise. Okay, that didn't work. Okay, so uh, that didn't work. The 30 pound monofilament, they went right through it into the garden in a five foot all the way around, went into the garden. So I lost most of my vegetables. So then the next step and final step was to install, have somebody install for me, uh, you know, very expensive, uh, six foot non-climbing horse fence. Okay, that worked. Oh, with a gate, that worked. Um, they haven't been getting in my garden ever since then, although now they're eating everything in the rest of my yard and several other yards that back onto this Burke Mill Creek and the woods. And they're, of course they're beautiful, these, these animals. But th what happened is, what started me was I started Googling and talking to various people at the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission, um, the, the management system, and finding out that in fact, um, and you may have noticed that we have seen deer on the side of the road. Maybe people in this room have hit a deer with their car. I never have, but I hope I never do. Um, we have an overpopulate, drastic overpopulation of deer problem in North Carolina. Um, in the eastern part of the state, the hunters have helped a lot um, to curtail it, but now the only thing that is um, in our area, although there are 62 cities in North Carolina or more who are members of the North Carolina Urban Archery Program, we are not one of them, and that's why I'm here. Um, it is the most, the Urban Archery Program promotes um, the, uh, it's the only cost-effective way that's been found so far to main, control and maintain a stable deer population. Um, they, uh, it, if it's, it enables cities, towns, and villages to reduce the deer population through increased hunter opportunity. It's only allowed in participating municipalities. Um, our deer population in North Carolina is approximately a million. And um, one of the other reasons that the deer population in the eastern part of the state has decreased is because of predators and disease. Um, so we would rather, instead of the deer succumbing to either automobile accidents or predators or disease, we would rather cull them in a humane way by having a proficient archer shoot them in a way that they die, they run off just very quickly and then they die. If they get hit by a car, number one, it takes them a long time to die. And by the time they get over to the side of the, you know, to the, side of the road or somebody has to lift them there, their body has been damaged drastically. They also can damage human people who are driving the cars. Um, uh, so that's what I mean that hunting has been found to be very cost effective. Now the other thing, um, is that the, was the next step for me was getting in the North Carolina urban archers have become very involved with the North Carolina hunters for the hungry. And that is one of the real keys. The goal of the North Carolina hunters for the hungry is to utilize an overabundant natural resource to meet the needs of the communities in which we live. Hunters legally harvest deer from an overabundant population and the meat processors produce high protein deer burger and food distribution networks distribute the meat to the people who are in need. There are 20, the, the, they use tax deductible financial resources to do all of this. The program process that this Hunters for the Hungry process is 35 to 40,000 pounds of venison for the hungry each season. And our season here is January to February. There are 20 deer processors across the state that are involved in the program, and the program is happy to accept hunter harvested deer from our area at the Guilford County Processing Station, which isn't very far. Um, so we can do two things. We can correct, well, more than that, correct the overpopulation, reduce the population that's causing accidents, causing farmers and just little piddly 
you know, gardeners like me. It does, you know. Uh, and then the big thing is to get this meat to the people who need it. So that's what's made me excited about the possibility of bringing the, these two you know, um, groups to our city and joining the rest of the 60, more, more than 62 cities in North Carolina. You know, there are, if you think about our town, yes, we have a big downtown, but when you think about the streets that go away from our downtown, like Renola Road, um, uh, well, I'm, I'm losing my, Robin Hood Road, um, Stratford Road, a lot of them, once you get beyond a certain point, it's wood, very woodsy, and these deer can live anywhere but they're having trouble eating last year oh, oh, top, last year they i have one hill in my yard going down to the creek that's covered with ivy to help hold the ill hill they were eating the ivy that's not good for them you know it's it's not good food yes i agree my garden food was better but i'd rather than not be eating that that's it yeah thank you miss Faye. I, I i'm sure that there are some people who might have questions if you don't mind, just, just, just taking a seat. We'll, we'll, we'll have a brief discussion. We'll direct our, our questions to Mr. DeCane. If we need to bring you back up, we will. Uh, members of the counseling committee, we know that, you know, at least twice in recent memory, we've had annexations. And there were a large amount of people who were annexed into the city who were once in suburban areas who were now sort of brought into the city in Winston-Salem. There are, there are large plots of land where urban hunting may be beneficial. You heard of hunters for hun the Hungry Hunters Program. Uh, so we, we've tried to address poverty and hunger in this city, so this may be an opportunity for us to progress in that regard. Uh, as I understand it, the way the program works is there were no, no hunting would be allowed on city property. Uh, no hunting would be allowed on private property. Only, you would only be allowed to hunt by bow. And if you do hunt on private property, it has to be done with written permission. And we have the opportunity to regulate the lot sizes uh, just to make sure that there isn't wild chaos going on with urban hunting and they would essentially be limited to the suburban areas. So with that being said, are there any questions that should be considered uh, at this time? Councilman Larson, then we come to Councilman Well, I, th I think it's a very interesting and, and creative program, and I'm sure Councilmember Adams will add to it because she's brought it up before. But I guess my question would be in regarding to the Hunters for Hunger, how much control or regulation do we actually have on their shooting and uh, gathering and then processing this. I mean, they're out in the woods and what kind of control do, would we actually have? Or would this basically be a voluntary sort of agreement that's a gentleman's agreement that they will in fact bring in their first kill or, wh or whatever it is uh, to, uh, to this processing process? I mean, it, it seems to me we got two issues here. We have one of an overpopulation of, a, of deer in the community uh, which is significant and problematic in a variety of ways, and I think you've made that point pretty clear. The other thing is trying to marry it then to feed the hungry, and I'm trying to figure out exactly how we integrate that in a way that is reliable as a food source uh, to be processed. Can you elaborate a little bit on that connection? Is it okay? Uh, yes, sir, I'll, I'll do my best. So what uh, Ms. Faye has presented are, are two separate issues. One is um, the city um, applying for the ability to hunt within the city limits. So uh, is the first. The Hunters for the Hungry is an opportunity for the hunters or say someone like, like Miss Fay if she decides to you know take a deer on her property if it meets the conditions set forth by the city council. Um, if she doesn't want to make use of that animal on for her own purposes she can take it and donate it to hunters for the hungry so the the hunting and the taking of the animals and the tagging and all that is handled through the through the state game uh, folks um, but it is it, it's something that's available now to hunters who, who don't hunt within city limits there's there are plenty of processors who will take um, animals from hunters anywhere and they'll process them and they're they have to meet certain standards you know health standards and they're inspected to make sure that that product meets all um, requirements before it's sent out for human consumption is your question satisfied mr larson well, so, so what, I, what i'm hearing is that the hunter for the hungry is really a voluntary process and there's nothing that the city mandates uh, that this meet a 
the GEAR product actually be processed in that way. That's correct. All right. And then the last real question I have would be oftentimes GEAR are processed in the field, and the entrails and stuff are in the gutting and even the skinning sometimes can occur. And is that being, I assume, would be addressed in some way because it would be on private property? Yes, sir. So the sanitation issues and health issues. And so as we explore this and the, the logistics from the time of permission to hunt on the property, the, the actual process of making sure that animal is removed after it's shot and not limping off into somewhere and not recovered, and then making sure that that animal is either re removed in an entirety uh, is a, some questions that I think we want to look at as we begin to formulate a policy on how to allow <coughs> them to, to occur. Councilman McIntosh. I live on a couple of acres of wooded land out near Wake Forest, and my wife gave up trying to grow hostas about 15 years ago because the deer love to eat hostas. My question go, questions go towards um, of the 62 cities or municipalities that already allow this, are there are any of them larger cities the size of us? Because I would think we're the fifth largest city in the state, so I would I would think that the concerns and the <coughs> issues that you run into in a smaller municipality could be different than what we could run into in a, a city the size of Winston-Salem. If there are larger cities in that list, I, I would like to look to them to see what their experiences have been and what kind of... Um, you know, either positive stories there are to tell or negative stories that they have. Um, do we have, do we keep data on deer strikes? I mean, it, it does seem as if there has been a, more of them around, but is there any, any data that goes with that assertion? Uh, uh, so uh, I answer your first question first and then we'll get to the deer strikes. Um, so th there's a list posted on, on the uh, state game. I'm going to use state game because I don't know the actual name of the organization. So on the state game website that um, lists all of the municipalities in there. So in, in, in doing my own research uh, for this evening, uh, Huntersville, no pun intended, uh, Concord, Kannapolis um, are some of the, the larger municipalities that are on that list. There, there's not a Raleigh, there's not a Charlotte, um, there's not a Durham. Um, and each ordinance is pretty similar. It requires hunting from a tree stand at least 10 feet above the ground, which makes you shoot at an angle reducing, um, you know, arrow travel beyond what you're actually shooting at. A lot of them have uh, the, the, the size of the area that you can hunt in varies uh, between one acres minimum or a combination of, of uh, contiguous properties that are at least one acre to up to five acres. Um, certainly no shooting on, no, no hunting on any public land, so no school, no park, no public right-of-way, not across or from a public right-of-way. Um, those sorts of things, but it, and almost every ordinance contains those items. They're they're all very similar with, with other than the land size. Um, the second question on the deer strikes, we we would have to pull that information together as far as um, city reports of, of deer strikes. Yeah. I mean, I can tell you myself, I hit a deer a few years back, and the only report there is is one to my insurance company. So. Uh, didn't do enough damage to, uh, you know, to prompt me to call a police officer, but it, it did enough damage for me to get a rental car for a few days. And bow hunting is now allowed in the county, or deer yeah. hunting, yes, not, but not within a city limit. Statewide, it's uh, allowed. And, and so I would imagine that the county health department has already established some rules and regulations on the 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 state through the state. through the through the game uh, folks. They're they're well established laws and rules. Um, in fact, you can't even hunt without passing a hunter safety course. You can't be licensed to hunt in the state without obtaining that first. Do we have the authority to make stricter rules in terms of, I think Mr. Larson was asking about as far as cleaning and gutting and things inside the city limit versus? Uh, I, I'm not certain of that. That's something we would have to look at. The hunting would take place on private property, um, but that's something that the attorneys and I would have to investigate. I would like to hear some experience from the larger cities on the list and what pros and cons they have seen from the, from the program. Yes, sir. Thank you. Councilwoman Adams. Yes, uh, as many of you know, as the city manager, I brought this up two or three times over the past 10 years that I felt like uh, we could help curb the deer population. And I'm a gardener slash farmer, 
and they had yeah, ate up all my hostas and everything. I ended up putting a very huge fence up to keep them from eating my produce. But I also am a big proponent of uh, helping to alleviate hunger. And I know that as much as we give vegetables, collards, and things like that, uh, kudos to Councilmember Molly Light, and I helped with the chicken, five chicken deal here in the city. Um, I think we need more protein for people. And when you live in urban areas, we don't have the luxury of pork and, and things like that and an abundance of chickens, fresh food. Uh, so I am a supporter of this. Um, my uh, concerns or questions would be, uh, I think that the fact that if we follow the rule of other cities, and I'd like for us to have a mission fact-finding tour, I'd love to go to one of the other cities to benchmark them to see how they're actually doing this. I'm not afraid of uh, having to uh, process me. I grew up doing that. Um, I'd like us to think about also a bigger scope, Mr. Chair, opportunities to create a startup business that processes deer and other uh, animals or whatever, because they're very far in between, as you see. Rural areas, they have that. Urban cities don't have it, but it also gives us an opportunity to create training programs to teach young people as well as hard to employ people, Mayor Pro Tem, in the skills of butchery. Uh, for those folks that are into urban farming and food, you know how big that is right now. It's not just chickens, it's pork, it's beef, it's deer, and it's everything else in between. Um, I would like to also look at a bigger scope of another thing, how this would affect our businesses that actually instruct archery and bow hunting in the area. I know when I worked at Johns Controls in Kernersville, there was a huge place across the street or on Mountain Street um, that was always very crowded. It was indoor and outdoor. So I would also like to look at that of possibly bringing them to the table to see what their thoughts are on this and how they can help us uh, to get people trained uh, so that people aren't arbitrarily just buying the bows and thinking that all I got to do is do like you know, back in the day when I was growing up, it's more to that. Uh, I took archery and bow when I was in college and, and in the old bow, and I enjoyed it uh, tremendously. So I, I support this. Thank you, Councilwoman Adams. Uh, Councilman Bessie, then we'll come to Mayor Brooklyn Burke. Yeah. I, I have some questions about the difference between the rural and small town environment uh, in terms of game management and the more fragmented. Uh, true urban environment. Um, you, I, I'm, I'm well aware of the importance of uh, hunting as a management tool for deer population uh, in the state and support that. Um, uh, we, I think there is a question that we need some professional evaluation on, um, and that is in terms of the, um, uh, the health of urban population uh, of deer. Uh, where they're channeled along right in yeah, as a practical matter the channel along wildlife corridors within the city and they're limited uh, I wouldn't want to inadvertently uh, create fragmented populations that had uh, you know, serious health issues uh, there uh, that could have an adverse uh, consequence on on the uh, uh, on neighborhoods as well um, so I'd, I'd like more information on that uh, I suspect that we see this in the smaller municipalities more than the, um, the bigger cities because, in essence, the environment that you're seeing for uh, that's friendly to the deer population in the smaller municipalities is more a continuation of the countryside, uh, where they're they're everywhere and, and they can go any place. Um, and I'm not sure that's the case in the in more urban uh, regions of the city. Might might be something that would make sense, for example, in the suburban uh, ring and and not uh, too far in, but I'm, I'm not sure. I'd, I'd like some professional you know, uh, biologist evaluation on that. And, and Mr. Bessie, certainly we'll get some feedback. Again, 
this committee and this council has the ability to ratchet the size of the acres down to virtually only include, you know, the more rural areas of the city. And, and just think about it, you know, at one point in time before they were annexed into the city, they could hunt. Now they're not able to hunt. So in essence, we sort of took their ability to do that. I think it's only right that we, we reconsider. Mel Pro Tim Burt, we saved all the wisdom for last. You, you have the floor. Thank you. I was going to say some of the things Councilwoman Adams mentioned, and also Mr. Bessie, Councilman, it's what we need to look at, but I also think we need to be get some more information. And it's always interesting when citizens bring us good information, but as we look at it and study it, then we can come up with more of a sound, sound type of recommendation. Councilman, Councilwoman Adams. Yes, and this may not uh, have anything to do with this uh, presentation, but how does the new amendment affect this? The hunting? The, mm -hmm. the, I, I don't think anyone has forward. a mastery of any yes. of the amendments. Yeah. So, so going forward, uh, as uh, Damon and uh, the attorney, they want to look at that too. Uh, the legal mm -hmm. government legal So what I'm hearing is general consensus to get information from the state on the amendments, also to get information from the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission. That's the name? Yes, sir. <laughs> All right. Uh, on, on just sort of the rules and regulations to hunting and what we can and cannot do as a city uh, if we decide to move forward. Uh, Councilman Larson, do you, do you want to add anything else that no, information I, people need to I bring back? I would only ask that we do some serious studying on how to incorporate the food component with the hunting component. And obviously, you know, that could be as simple as the private homeowner whose land is being hunted on requiring that the first kill be donated or something. But there needs to be some linkage, clear linkage, if we're going to use this to feed the hungry as to how that's going to actually happen. And I, I think we need some prototype or models as to how to encourage that, if nothing else. Mayor Pro Tem Burke, then Councilman. But did, were you pointing to Mr. Bessie? No. Okay. May I approach Councilman Burton? Yeah, Councilman I, Just McIntosh. at least I would like to get some feedback from other um, larger communities about their experience with President Trump. Okay. I was going to say Mayor earlier Burton. when the airport came to us about hunting, just review that a little bit, City Manager. Mayor Pro Tim Burke, uh, several years ago, uh, the airport came to us because they have a, they continue to have a problem with deer uh, getting in, getting onto the runways. They, in fact, that summer actually had another another accident uh, where a, a, a plant was taxing, no one was hurt, but the plant was significantly damaged. Uh, this council uh, amended our city code and the airport is, is allowed under our city code to, as long as they have the fruit requirements, they have to have a, a wildlife state or, state or federal wildlife officer certified. Um, and they have to use a shotgun and they have to be 800 feet away from the perimeter of the airport, they can actually use shotguns to to cull the deer. And one of the last things I want to point out is that you know I received a call today from a resident who lives on Butler Street, where a deer was hit in the road, and the deer is laying in front of his house right now as we speak. And you know it's, it's been there overnight, and so you've got all kind of critters and animals that are coming into the yard feasting on the deer and I mean th th there are problems that we have the opportunity to correct and to address mm -hmm. and I think if we are careful and crafted this could be something that could be used to benefit the citizens in our community uh, from all walks of life so Ms. Faye thank you for your presentation mm -hmm. we appreciate your time before we move forward is there anything that you might want to add briefly if you could come to the mic please uh, that BD said about go thinking bigger and maybe um, since Guilford is the closest processing plant, maybe we should go think really big and, and maybe end up having a processing plant of our own in Winston-Salem. And we would be the first big city in North Carolina to go for this, if, if that's the way we find we can think. I agree that we should, we should look at other cities to see what they do, but I, I'm also a fan of being a trailblazer and stepping out in front and getting things done first. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Mr. DeCain, is there anything else to add for this item? No, sir. Okay. Councilmember Adams, briefly. One more. Uh, check into the Department of Agriculture and see if there are monies available if we did go pursue this for helping to 
facilitate the training, building, processing, whatever we do. Okay. Uh, Mr. DeCane, do you feel like uh, December will be enough time to gather the information, or should we push towards the new year? Okay. I like right. option B best, sir. Well, we always measure 10 times and cut once, so we'll, we'll take an appropriate amount of time to study it. We'll bring it back in January. It'll give us a fresh set of ears and eyes. Yes, Thank sir. you for your time on this one, Ms. Faye. We appreciate you bringing this to our attention. Uh, item G2, please. G2, Dockless Bicycle and Scooter Share Programs presentation. All right. I believe you've given us some information on this. It will also be Mr. DeCane. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening again. Good evening. Chairman, Mayor Pro Tem, members of the committee. Uh, before Mr. Burzik comes up, uh, I'd like to reach out to the uh, committee and basically state that staff it would, would recommend at this point uh, to follow suit of some of our uh, sister municipalities in, in recommending the removal of the scooters uh, based on several factors. There's, there's clearly a safety issue. Um, we have accessibility issues on the sidewalks, uh, where they're being placed. Um, there's still the legal question as to whether they're, they're, they're legally permitted on the street or not. And uh, it, based on those factors, staff recommends that we, we ask for a temporary removal from the company, from the streets of Winston-Salem, until, until we have a chance to, A, resolve the legality issue of, of street operation or not, and B, to allow the council to um, help staff develop an ordinance to regulate these things when, when they do come back. Well, thank you for your presentation, Mr. DeCain. I, I think we all are extremely familiar with these scooters. You're going to have half the people that want to keep them. You're going to have half the people who want to put them away. Uh, if it's an order, members of the committee, Chief, I'm putting you on the spot. Do, do, do you, can you speak to, or someone on your staff may be able to speak to, the possible public safety implications of the scooters in, in the downtown region? I get reports all the time of people darting in the streets and people may have been hit or almost hit. Is there something that we should consider before we make this decision? Thank you, uh, Chair Taylor and members of the committee. Um, I have asked that one of our downtown bike patrol specialists come in and speak to us um, particularly to this issue. I think um, we can all agree that the majority of the usage that we've seen has been in our downtown area. However, we are starting to see um, the usage of the scooters stretch outside of the downtown uh, core or footprint of our downtown area. So I'm going to ask um, Jeremy Henry to speak to um, what he has seen in um, working in our downtown area. It's C Captain Henry, correct? Corporal. Corporal Henry, excuse me. Good evening, Council Members. Good evening. Um, we have seen a major uptick in the bird issues. Uh, there's been accidents. We've had at least three in the downtown area, um, none that I know of to be serious, but when you're riding with a bird and compared to a car, they're going to be uh, potential for serious injury. They have one little light on the front and they have one little light on the back, and it's, it's, it's hard to see them at night. We're getting repeated uh, calls from the community about them riding on the sidewalks. I uh, had one gentleman come to the office and said that he was coming up the stairs there at Cherry Street and one came by on the sidewalk and actually clipped him, knocking him down. So it's, it's one of those issues, the, um, going the wrong way on one-way streets. And we're talking, a, we're talking as, as young as, as probably 8 to 10 years old and going on up getting on these scooters and riding them everywhere. And there's just been, there, we get at least two to three calls and every day that seems like we're getting more calls on them going, doing things on the scooters that she probably shouldn't be doing downtown. And the only thing I can add to that is based on the number of pedestrians we have walking on the sidewalk, the amount of traffic that's just, it, since uh, Business 40 is closed down, we're, we're just getting inundated with different calls. Uh, thank you for your, your comments, Corporal Henry. That was important for us to hear. Um, we know that Bird just sort of came in, they dropped the scooters down on the streets, and people just started to operate them. Some people believe them to have been a public nuisance, others a viable form of transportation. There must be a healthy balance between the two. And what I'm hearing is, I don't believe that this committee would suggest that we permanently pick them up, but just if we needed to pick them up, pick them up until we're able to put regulations in place to ensure that all parties on both sides are safe. This committee does have the authority to direct the city manager to pick them up 
uh, starting tomorrow or you know, effective this evening. I want to hear from you guys as to how do we want to move. Let's start with Mayor Pro Tem Burke. Well, I agree with some of the we'll things just come down the line. and also, Corporal, I thank you for your information you. concerning it. Um, I've talked to the city manager about those bird scooters, and I think that we need to do something because they're not safe. Not only downtown, but when you're riding home on New Walker Town Road, and you have someone on the scooter in where the green, the orange line is, and it's dust stop. Well, anybody could get killed, and it's going to cause a lot of problems. So I feel that we need to look at it. If you could get those scooters off tonight, <laughs> it would be good for this city. Councilman McIntosh. I've been a pretty outspoken proponent of um, allowing these to operate, um, and I have been in conversation with representatives from uh, Bird, and I've become increasingly frustrated with the lack of change in behavior from a company standpoint. Um, about where they're located, about the lack of communication with riders on what is legal and what is not legal. I don't see behavior changing at all amongst the people who ride them. The, the only reason I'm going to vote against taking them off the streets immediately is, I guess I'm, I'm not sure what the process will be for us getting them back. And I don't want it to languish forever. I, I think they're a valuable, potentially a valuable part of the community. Um, especially in the shutdown period. Anything we can do to take cars off the streets, we should do. Um, our downtown streets are already at an F level, a failed level, which is okay because that's the speed we want traffic to be moving in downtown. So I think it's possible to accommodate both. Um, but I need to see a better plan of action. But I, and I don't, I'm afraid that if we, if we pull them off the street, then we're, we're not going to get them back for a long period of time, and I would be against that. Well, before I move to Councilman Larson, is there anyone from Bird who's here today? Okay, we'll, we'll give you an opportunity in just a moment. Uh, we certainly want to hear from you. Uh, Mr. Larson, you have the floor. Yeah, I, I think I've expressed my opinion on this multiple times in various committees. Um, the ultimately um, bird, which has been deposited illegally on our streets and sidewalks from the get-go and for the last three months have uh, operated in this city without license uh, or controls and ultimately have relied on the individual operators to perform within the law, which they have not done, uh, and yet seems to rely only on the city police department to do any enforcement, which the council has not yet been willing to turn them loose to do. Uh, we can endure this uh, for another couple months uh, as we tend to try to figure out how to incorporate them. I think there is a way. Uh, other cities have uh, removed them and then proceeded to negotiate with Bird or Lime or our own bicycle corporations to find ways to uh, bring them back and have them in an orderly manner as a transportation alternative. I think they will be a good uh, alternative, but I think we've got to find a way immediately to bring this thing under control. I've had numerous complaints about this. I know it's all anecdotal, but I have to respond to that. Uh, I do think that I hope, I'd hope Bird would use the opportunity to have tried to control them a little better. Uh, I don't know if they have the capacity to do that. And I certainly didn't see the willingness when they first came to this city to aggressively address the problems that they knew they were going to have to address. Uh, so here we are, three months later now, whatever it's been, and the problem only gets worse by the day. And there's a variety of suggestions that I have to regulate these things, and I think the city council can discuss those in an orderly manner. Uh, and provide some framework and protocols in which they operate, and then we can bring them back and get them on. But I'm not willing to go another day to allow the chaos that's existing currently on our sidewalks and streets with these particular elements without license. Councilwoman Adams. Yes. Um, outside of Mr. Councilmember Taylor and uh, Ms. Burr, uh, I've lived here all my life. And I'm okay with change. I'm good with change. Change is good. But I am old school and new school. I didn't like the way, even though I had been monitoring my colleagues telling me about what was happening in their cities with the scooters and the uh, transportation, the new transportation mode. I think for me as a politician and elected official, I don't like the fact they disrespected my city. 
You know, we spend our time trying to make it a better place, quality of life, try to keep it clean, not cluttered, safe. And then some complete strangers come in and drop their product line in our city. I don't have a problem against, again, thinking that we have to always constantly work on trying to make the city better, get younger people here, other people here, but you can't do it at the expense of the people that are already here. You know, yes, we have an older generation city, but now we've gotten them after decades of wanting them to walk, neighborhoods, that's bicycles. Now we have scooters that didn't come into the process the way everything else came into the process. That's my issue with Bird and Lyme and everybody else. Again, uh, I am with Ms. Burke, you know, because I, over the past two months, maybe, I probably had 10 situations that either I almost lost my life or I almost ended someone else's life, a child on a scooter, coming down University Parkway, major intersection, Northwest Boulevard, Renolda Road, Polo Road. I'm of the adage, Chair, we need to take them off the streets for a while, and we won't be the first city. Most of my colleagues told me that's what they had to do while we were in LA, to get some order into this, to, to listen to them, listen to the city, listen to customer public input, I, safety, public safety. I think we need the plan of removing them from the streets and come up with a plan to, you know, implement them back into the system with some rules that we all can live by. Because the last thing I would want is somebody being uh, hurt or injured or dying from these scooters. And it doesn't have to be the person on the scooter. It could be a person in a motorized wheelchair. It could be a person riding a bike that, because they go by them, they could end up in the middle of the street in front of cars. I just think, like everything else we do, we need to think this process through. And to the bird people, it won't be forever. We just got to get this situation under control. And I hope that you would tell your brand, your company execs or whoever, you know, the worst thing you can do, and I worked in corporate America, one of the biggest brands it is, Johnson Controls. The worst thing you can do is destroy your brand's image and public, uh, public perception and everything else and customers wanting to use it because you didn't take the time to come and introduce yourselves to us. And if this is what you've been doing all over the country, more power will tell you, but it don't work in Winston-Salem. So I look forward to the conversations, Mr. Chair. Councilman Bitt. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I remember when this first came to the committee in Public Works. Um, and I was opposed to a knee-jerk reaction. Um, I, I had not seen their usage. I didn't want to presume that there would be a problem until and unless I saw evidence that there was a problem. I didn't want us to get a reputation as this, you could stay off our lawn, uh, you know, jurisdiction. Um, and unfortunately, I've seen a lot of problems since then, and I've, I've gotten a lot of you know, it is anecdotal feedback, but it is consistent um, uh, that uh, um, that there is a uh, uh, a serious public safety issue with the way the scooters are being used now. Um, hopefully, we can address that with a reasonable regulation scheme. Uh, but um, at this point, it's not self-managing. Um, I, I have. Uh, I've never seen anyone with a helmet on in the city. Uh, um, yeah. All right. <laughs> We've got one. Ha haven't seen, a haven't seen Mr. One. McIntosh riding them, but um, <laughs> um, yeah, I've seen a lot of people on them. I've never seen anybody with a helmet on here. Um, uh, I see them operating on the sidewalk when we know they're not supposed to be on the sidewalk. Um, uh, I, I see them uh, running at night. They're very, as has been pointed out, they're very difficult to see. Um, uh, and uh, I've, I've seen quite a bit of operation in blithe dis disregard of, of reasonable safety rules that everyone else is expected to, uh, uh, to follow. Um, 
at, at this point, having opposed it initially, uh, I, I favor asking the company to, uh, to pick them up um, without further delay. Um, and then let's sit down and look at an ordinance. I think we can we can craft something within a reasonable period of time that would address the issues and and um, uh, help the company that is, appears to be currently unable to effectively regulate the safe use of the product to to do that in the future. Members of the committee, if you will just bear with me, I feel like I, I can I can hear all sides of the equation and probably have us out of here by seven o'clock. Uh, if it's in order, we do allow from time to time the public to speak on certain situations. Before we get to Bird, uh, Councilwoman elect Scipio, you will be representing the East Ward come Monday. Uh, it, can, can you give us just a brief comment on your thoughts uh, representing the East? We went we around the table and heard from all the rest of the council members, and I think it's in order to, to, to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, I am very concerned about these scooters in east, on the east side. Uh, I have two, re two things I love about it. Number one, it's bringing a lot of activity. People are out about on the streets. I haven't seen the scooters uh, are, are seen as an alternative. Um, and it's bringing a little energy to the neighborhoods where I hadn't seen people out and about. Um, and I like that. However, they're very reckless, and um, that is, it's dangerous. Um, I, too, have had an occasion to say, my goodness, I almost hit that person because I didn't see them. They are not visible at twilight and at dark. The people are riding them in the wrong spots, not just on the sidewalks, but in the middle of the street. Um, not on the side where a bicyclist would ride, not um, with the traffic, coming against the traffic. There, there, it's an education process that I think the riders need. Uh, I am concerned about the age of the riders. I've seen some fairly young people on these scooters. I have not tried them myself, so I really don't know how to access and get on them. Uh, we can get you hooked I, up with one tonight. I, excuse me? We can get you hooked up with one tonight if you That's will. okay. I'm old enough not to, I know what not to get on. <laughs> but it seems like it's a wonderful tool for people who need to go back and forth to work. But I just think we need to uh, put some regulations out there. You've got to educate the public on the safe use of those devices. Uh, the other thing that is a problem is where they are being parked. Uh, some of the places they are parked are right in the walkways of some businesses or some churches um, or right in the middle of the walkway where people walk, not on a right-of-way area, but right on the sidewalk. Um, so I think we need to look at how do we make this a better opportunity for everyone. Um, I am very excited that they came to town and people took up, took them up. I, I like that. However, uh, I did not know that they came without the proper introduction of having the proper license and uh, letting us know. I think there is something about respect that you do at all times. You respect the community. You respect the people. Um, but for the East Ward, I've seen a lot of activity. I like that. But I do know that we need to educate the people who use it. Um, I've seen it a lot down in the business quarter, uh, the renovation quarter. It seems like a great tool to come up the street. Um, but I think we do need some, we need to at least suspend it and get some proper reg uh, regulations, but importantly, education to the users, because um, I see a, a real problem getting ready to happen, as opposed to something that's going to be thriving. Thank you for your comments. All right, representatives from Bird, we, we've, we've got a, we certainly don't want to limit your voice. I think you are the, some of the most important people in the room at this time, given this topic. So if you would give your name and your address for the record, and then you have the floor. Absolutely. My name is Servando Esparza. I am Senior Manager of Government Partnerships for BIRD. 
My address is 810 West St. Johns Avenue, Austin, Texas. Um, I'm gonna, I took a lot of notes, so if I go back and forth, it's uh, to make sure not to leave a lot out. I, I guess I'll start with, um, in response to Councilwoman Adams, the, please understand that it was not to be disrespectful to the city of Winston-Salem, the way that we launched. What, hap what happens with this micromobility and this type of technology and this new type of concept is to show a city that this is something that the residents will actually adopt, they'll use, that it'll be helpful, is often much better to, to show it than to come up with the idea. If I came to you guys a couple months ago and said, hey, at some point, folks in your city are gonna love some scooters, and they're gonna use them instead of taking car trips, you might laugh at me, you might think that that, that doesn't happen here. And so a lot of times, it's, it's much easier to, to show that this is a viable form of transportation. And it's, it's viable because we've seen in cities that we operate in the, in, in the US is that there's this area where um, it's too far to walk and too short of a distance to take a, a cab, an Uber, Lyft, um, any uh, ride share or to drive yourself and look for some parking. So the reason why we're seeing so many cities adopt ordinances and, and pilot programs for dockless mobility in general, bikes, scooters, um, and then what may come next is that folks wanna take these types of devices to get around instead of drive their vehicles. So one of them is to prove to, to um, the city that folks in Winston-Salem would adopt this type of program. That said, this is, this is a, bird scooters are a transportation option. They're not a toy. And for our users not to use them correctly is something that for us, if a user is not using it correctly, if reported, we can take action on that user. We, we want to ensure that bird scooters stay. And that's something that, like I mentioned, that it's a viable transportation option. We want that to be available and that's why um, we, while we started in, in the downtown area and grew out, we wanna make sure that this is a transportation option for all residents, that, it, that it's not just something that's for either tourists or something for only the areas with, with high density. We want this to actually be a transportation option that folks can use it for the last mile to get to their last transit stop or just to replace a, a uh, a car trip because we know that that's better for the environment, that's better in general for the traffic um, issues that um, Council Member McIntosh talked about. So, you know, uh, like I mentioned, that we're operating in, in almost 100 cities in the United States. There's absolutely ways that we need to improve operations. Absolutely. Whether it's reporting and then we take action on those reports, whether it be um, and I'll take several instances. For those situations where you see about three scooters that maybe be parked wrong and maybe park, uh, maybe blocking the sidewalk, that's one of our chargers that drop those scooters off. So it, for our action items for that is if reported or we see it, is to let that charger know that is a bad drop. We got, a, we got a, a, um, an email today from uh, Council Member McIntosh that was fixed shortly after we, we had someone knock over some other scooters, that was fixed again. We have to be responsive to the issues that come up. Educating that charger, where you left those scooters is not okay. Um, if you do it again, you may not no longer be able to work for, or um, be a charger for Bird. So those types of, a types of action items. Along with um, adding different tools that we have tested in other cities to be implemented here, um, in like very dense areas, we have what we've called, and we just launched them in Raleigh, um, what are called bird watchers. Those are individuals that their entire job is to walk around and ensure that scooters are parked upright, that they're not in the way, and uh, to ensure that there's always pedestrian um, space for someone to walk. Um, there, there's something that's being actually rolled out fairly soon. It should be in the first week of December, which is what we call community mode that oftentimes someone will say, I don't know how to get a hold of, you know, Bird to make this complaint. 
we have contact information on the scooters. People can email us at hello at bird.co or you know give us a call. There's numbers on the on the scooters. We want to be as responsive as possible. In the app itself, someone's going to be able to report that you know scooter you know the code that's included in it is parked incorrect incorrectly on this cross street. So we know exactly um, when that was reported and, and how fast to, re to uh, respond to it. To the point on regulations, I, I believe that the Public Works Committee that's meeting tomorrow was going to get a presentation on, on potential ideas, some of which um, come from ordinances that, um, or the pilot program in Charlotte, or the ordinance that was passed in Durham, um, some of the provisions that uh, Greensboro is talking about tomorrow. So there's kind of a, a bit of, of uh, pieces from a lot of other ordinances which tackle the issue of ensuring that we pick up scooters by 9 p.m. Uh, they can't be out, uh, into, can't go out um, until 6 a.m. To, to avoid some of the issues that you talked about in terms of, of lights. Um, and then we're actually improving our scooters so that the newer versions have a more, a brighter light um, they're heavier, so they and the kickstand's a little um, uh, reinforced, so that they're likely to stay up a lot longer, uh, stand up right. So there's a lot of improvements that we can make, and so I think some of the what I saw the presentation for the Public Works Committee, those are all doable pieces for regulations, and regulations is not anything we're afraid of, um, and so I'll, I'll happy to answer any questions. Mr. Sparza, I think you've heard strongly from the council members and the committee on this subject. Mm -hmm. I'm always a fan of the concept of when two reasonable people or two reasonable groups of people sit down, uh, a deal can always be made. And it sounds like the city is reasonable in its approach to whether or not Bird has a place in the city. I think we believe that we do. I think it sounds on your end that you're willing to sit down with us and negotiate on regulations because even though this is going to public works for a presentation, it has become a public safety issue which we must address. And if, if there aren't regulations and rules in place and one person gets hurt, especially if it's a young child, then we could be held liable. So I think we have a responsibility to our public safety uh, personnel and to the citizens of this community to come to an agreement with BIRD in order to, to move forward. I, I understand that uh, Ms. Easter from the Cycling Commission is here as well. Uh, if, if you're happy to have some input if you feel like you need to. Uh, we, we certainly don't want to belabor the hour, but we do have a question to consider, and that is whether or not we want to pick the bird scooters up effective immediately and hold them until there is regulation put in place uh, that ensures the safety of the people of this community. And we, we've heard from everybody. I don't think there's there's need to belabor the hour. So I call the question. Is, is, there, is there any other comments that need to be made before the question is called? I make, I make one, one point of order here. Um, the, the electric scooter is not the primary, is not the sole uh, provider of electric scooters in this country. Our regulations will apply to any company that comes in. So the fact that your company is trying to address specific issues and concerns which have been brought to mind because of your company, you say you dropped them in here and you were going to see if they worked. Well, we've seen that. You know, and so now we've got all these questions and details that we're trying to work out. I think we're happy to have you at the table, but we have to also remember that you're not the sole provider of this service. And whatever we, whatever regulations we prepare then will be available to any company that wants to come in and provide that service. And I do believe, based on what you've shown us, that there is a market here for that. And we're not, we're not contesting the value of that market or what it could mean for this community. What we're contesting in a way is the way that it's been implemented to date here, and, and we're not going to allow that to continue. We've got to find a better way to do this, and we're going to put a pause on this thing. We're going to hit the pause button, hopefully, and we're going to come up, and I'm welcoming to have you at the table to discuss your suggestions of how to run these things safely at night, for example, uh, which they're not doing right now. So um, that, that I just want to be clear that these discussions are not aimed exclusively at your company. Mr. Duquesne. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I, I would make a recommendation in fairness to, to Bird. Should the committee decide to move forward with um, asking for the removal of the scooters, that we, we set forth a time frame to allow 
bird to retrieve the scooters, and then after that time frame, if they're not gone, should the should the committee go that direction, that uh, then city staff would would uh, Im impound them. Mr. Decane, do you or Mr. Sparza have an idea of the appropriate amount of time uh, that's necessary to, to 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 function to do that? I, I manager. Well, the, um, by their def by their model, they pick them up every night and charge them. So, I would think. But within three six hours, they should be able to remove them from the street. How soon might we be able, if this committee wishes to move that way, how soon might we be able to negotiate with Bird in order to bring back regulations to get them back on the streets and oper and operative uh, and moving forward? Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, so we, uh, Mr. Berzik's here. He'll he'll be presenting tomorrow night at the Public Works Committee on uh, all the items that, that you just heard about. There there are plenty of options in there. However, city staff still feels like there is a statutory issue that needs to be resolved as to the legality of these devices on streets. City code already uh, prohibits their operation on sidewalks. So without clear, de clear direction from the state on whether or not they're allowed on the streets, um, we still have that issue. But as far as the regulations, the ages, and how they're parked and where, we have recommendations for the council on all of that. Councilman McIntosh. I know staff hates these. I mean, I, I get that. I think if we're going to pull them off tonight and not let them back on tomorrow, I don't think that's fair to people who are using them. And I, I think a, some period of notification is, is would be really good to do. Um, if my main, main, if I have transitioned to using a bird as my means of transportation, and it all of a sudden disappears, I would have liked to have had some heads up on that. Ooh. And I'd also like to see some time frame. For us to commit to to getting some rules and regulations in order to get these things back because it, you know that that could languish for a long period of time if it's not a hard and fast date i'd like to have i'd like to get commitment from Daniel. from council at least uh, gentlemen's agreement that uh, we'll have this thing back together and have a set of guidelines uh, in relatively short order Okay, so we've got to set a time frame on the pickup if mm -hmm. the committee wishes to do it. And we have to set a time frame on the negotiations. Councilmember Adams, then Councilmember Burke on final words, and then let's move forward with, with the question. Again, my issue is always safety. You all know that. I, you know, this is a great idea, great startup, whatever. Um, I got that. But when it comes to the safety of our citizens, you can't sit and negotiate whether today or tomorrow. When you know in the industry, I go, there is an unsafe condition going on right as we sit here. Mm -hmm. I propose we remove these things immediately. Everybody else has done likewise. Mm -hmm. It's no disrespect to them. Mm -hmm. It's the fact that we are the elected officials and we are the ones awesome. that people look to to make the right and just decisions. Yeah. I will not be supporting not picking them up. I'm for picking them up ASAP. They pick them up every night. They put them out every morning. It's not like they got to go get some transportation plan. Meanwhile, the press and everybody's here. We got Channel 13. We got our modes of communication. We notify the public just like other cities did as to why we had to do this move. Always safety first. Always. Yeah. Pro Tim Burke. I was going to make a motion that we remove them tonight. A motion is in order. So the, the motion is that we remove them tonight and that we direct the city manager uh, to do that and then negotiate with Bird yes. on how we get back to this committee. There is a presentation give, being given to Public Works tomorrow, which will give us some extreme insight on how we move forward. Mm -hmm. So that, that is the motion. Is that your motion, I'm Mayor Pro Tempore? Is there a second? I second. Comments? Mr. McIntosh. I don't know that we want to say that there's a time frame that we negotiate with Bird. I think it's a time frame that we come up with a framework of regulation that would allow provider to come back in. To yeah. come back in. And they're not as any problem. Or long or whoever. Exactly. Mr. Manager. And, and I think we can be back um, by January with a, with a, with a, with a clear ordinance. Yes, sir. We, we will commit to that. So it will be brought back to this committee in January. By that time, we will have regulations and rules in place to ensure the safety of the people of this community. Is that correct? Yes. I want to make sure we, we're building the consensus. Council Member Bessie, I saw your face. Yeah. Uh, I don't think that anyone can commit to having an ordinance in place in January. I think that the amendment back. can be made to bring back a, a solid Absolutely. proposal uh, in January. Fair. So, Councilman McIntosh. Does the vote here to remove them have to be unanimous? 
Oh, it, it, I think it didn't have to be unanimous, but it just has to be a majority decision. I, Mr. I Manager. Would, once I've, I've heard from the mayor who strongly supports their immediate removal, I did talk to Councilmember Clark, who said he'd go along with the wishes of the rest of the council. Okay. So we have a motion. We have a second. All in favor of removing them tonight and moving forward with uh, the rules and regulations in, in the very near future, please vote yes. Opposers, uh, likewise. Uh, that passes officially three to one. So the city manager is so hereby uh, directed to do accordingly. Thank you. Yes, I don't want to prolong things, but if we were allowed yeah, to do things like this, uh, they have come in, and other groups can come in and do the same thing. They have not shown us the kind of respect. No disrespect to you, but you've not been respectful to us. And if you are a leader and you represent this city, it's not your personal something that you're concerned about because you may like them or I like them. You do what's right for the citizens that were said so well by the council. Thank you. All right. Is there any other business that should be considered for the good of the order? The consent and the general agendas have been completed. Seeing no further business, I hereby consider this meeting to be adjourned. Thank you.